I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Stuart Kaufman, a medical doctor, theoretical biologist, and complex systems researcher who studies the origin of life on Earth. Dr. Kaufman has been a professor at the University of Chicago, University of Pennsylvania, Santa Fe Institute, and the University of Calgary. He is currently Emeritus Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Pennsylvania and Affiliate Faculty at the Institute for Systems Biology. He's been honored with multiple awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. So, Stuart, welcome. Uh, today, we're discussing concepts from a paper that you co-authored with Dr. Dean Radin entitled, Is the Brain-Mind Quantum a Theoretical Proposal with Supporting Evidence? So let me start out by asking if you could tell me a little bit about the paper and what led you to write it. Well, let me begin by talking about Dean. Uh he has worked on psi phenomena, telepathy, psychokinesis, and so on for many, many, many years, Tib. The field has been greeted with complete hostility for half a century. Yeah. Uh, it, in fact, not even talking about psi phenomena, like something as weird as telepathy, even talking using the word consciousness 40 years ago, in polite scientific society was forbidden. Somewhere in the mid 80s, what Philip Anderson, Nobel laureate called the C word became, that's consciousness. You could begin to say consciousness in about the 1980s. Uh, so now it's okay to say consciousness. My impression of Dean having known him for a while is he is absolutely solid, serious, careful. Uh, so I trust his results and those that he reports because I trust him. Um, uh, he has dealt with rejection, the whole field has. Uh, it's as if the world really thinks classical physics is all that there is, which is remarkable because quantum physics has been around for almost 100 years. The debate that makes that sensible is the belief until recently that quantum mechanics could have nothing to do in the warm, wet environment of the brain. So for a long time, people have said it's got to be nuts or whatever it is. But an important thing to say, I'll just say it up front, there's now increasing evidence for quantum phenomena uh, in the mind-brain-wet system. We'll get to it. Dean's steady. Well, and, and that's that's wonderful. I mean, he does amazing, absolutely amazing work. And then the thing that excites me about you is you are a medical doctor. You're a biologist. I mean, you have just such a track record in terms of rock-solid research right and and so that adds so much and both of you worked together on this paper you know the, the brain mind quantum i guess um and for me this is really exciting because it, it it does seem like it's bringing 21st century technology into you know into biology and medicine which has been very stuck in classical physics um it has i know you have a set of questions uh i, I do want to say with some amusement the history of getting this paper, well, I joined forces with, with, with Dean in part because I've had my own possibly telepathic experiences around my daughter's death, and I've been interested since then. I admired Dean. He's had a hard time getting published, and I thought, I have a slightly better reputation as a regular scientist. If we join forces, maybe I can help get his stuff out before a wider public. And this podcast is part of doing that. Take it seriously. Look at the data. Just look at the data. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it changes slow, right? I mean, but, it, you know, over time, it, you know, this data piles up. And I've covered a variety of these topics, like the Global Consciousness Project. And, you know, I mean, they have 25 years of data. And they have gone through that statistically and sliced and diced it every which way and applied every method of rigorous analysis, you know, to, to say, you know, is this noise or is there something there? And it strongly appears that there is something there, right? So I think it's one of those things that over time, you know, as, you know, as scientifically minded people, um, you know, we begin to accept, right? It's like, okay, there's, there's more there than we thought in the past. Um, well, so if it's okay, let me get into the brain mind. I, I want to delineate between these two for the audience. Could we say that the brain is a physical organ that does the thinking and the mind is kind of an emergent process 
would could you compare this maybe a little bit to the hardware and software relationship that you might see in a computer? Maybe, Ted. Can I slice at this in a slightly different way? It'll sure. get where you want to go. So we've been talking about these problems for a very long time. Uh, some history, uh, in fact, is in the paper. Uh, in in the year 400, uh, St. Augustine reasoned our consciousness is a direct connection with the mind of God. And the church still holds that, and, and maybe it's true. But anyway, that's the church's position. Uh, in about... The early 1600s, I guess it was, it, it, yeah. 16, anyway, Spinoza came up with a, 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 mono, a, a, a monism. How could I not have the exact dates right? Anyway, Spinoza uh, 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 excommunicated Jew who was busy making lenses, uh, came up with a monism. He was just the greatest philosopher of, of that century, except for Descartes. So, his monism was a single substance with two aspects, a mental aspect and a physical aspect. Um, and the idea was that same substance could have both of these properties. The question for Spinoza was what held the two in temporal concordance? Why are they happening at more or less the same time? And he said the mind of God's doing that. Hmm. That view, Spinoza's, has become neutral monism today. Namely, there's a single substance with mental and physical aspects, and very, very good philosophers. Bertrand Russell, uh, I guess I'll, I'll think of some of the others, all held it at the turn of the 20th century. So that's one strand. The single substance strand then gets partitioned into its all mind. That's Berkeley's idealism. And somehow body is congealed mind or it's materialism, everything is matter. It's the brain that's a, a bunch of material stuff that's going to have pretty real problems, but it's the dominant view now saying, let's find the neural correlates of consciousness. Then Descartes comes along at about the same time as Spinoza, and he says, there's two stuffs, mental stuff, raise cogitan, and physical stuff, raise extensa. Uh, and they're both stuffs. It's a... It's a, it's a uh, it's a substance dualism, and race coach attended his mind. At the same time as he did that, the, the princess uh, in Sweden said, but, but René, how does the mind stuff act on the body stuff? And that's the mind-body problem. Okay, can I just say it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you take classical physics, and it's causally closed, then what Descartes seems to be doing is asking mind, which is not physical, to act causally on brain. But it can't. All the causes are in the brain. So take Newton. The current state of the brain is entirely sufficient to determine the next state of the brain. So there's nothing for mind to do. And worse, there's no way for mind to do it. What's it supposed to do? Change the way the the... the Electrons are flowing. So that's the mind-body problem. And then David Chalmers says, this is the hard problem. You can find all the hardware you want. You will never understand qualia, actual experiences. So that's a statement of the, that's it. That's the mind-body problem. And in that context, the statement that somehow mind emerges from brain could be consistent with neutral monism. It's probably closest to neutral monism, right? I, I have an entirely different view but it's it's closest to Spinoza because nobody wants Descartes' dualism, and I think Spinoza's wrong, but that's okay. Uh, we'll, get... well, and so you're getting deep into the philosophy part of things. So I one thing I want to touch on is um this quantum nature of mind, right? The dualism and the philosophy, all of this has kind of been picked up by new age media. And yep. one of the challenges has been that it's been misrepresented many times, right? And yep. this has led to a lot of pushback by the traditional scientific community, and rightfully so, right? You have people who Absolutely. are taking terms and definitions, and and they're they're using them incorrectly, you know. And but yep. I, I think the challenge then is it makes it harder for you know explorers like yourself 
who understand what it is, how it works and how it fits together. And so, um, you know, how would you respond to, I guess, the criticisms of kind of the, the, you know, the new age misuse of this? And is there a way to overcome the stigma for, you know, quantum consciousness that this has created? I think the stigma is deserved. It's, it's the quantum woo woo. Yeah. Uh, and, and we just don't need it. Uh, quantum mechanics is understood. There's de debates about the, what's called the measurement problem. It's thoroughly solid science. If we're going to talk about it, know the thoroughly solid science, including quantum mechanics. Uh, so we're just going to have to brush it aside, Ted. There's, the way to do it is to do the science right and say, here are experiments that can be done. Here are the results. Here's the doubts about the results. Can we disconfirm the results or reconfirm the results, which is how science is done? We're in a position to do that now. Ah, uh, okay. Well, so nearly everyone has had experiences that traditional science just can't explain, right? You'd mentioned one with your daughter's passing. Um, you know, we call these I mean, traditionally like precognition, clairvoyance, phenomena like that. Yeah. So in the paper with Dr. Radin, uh, you discussed non-localism and suggested that it could explain these experiences, right? The 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 collection of psi experiences or psychic, I guess. Well, I did. Uh, does your audience need to know what non-local uh, non-locality is? Well, I, if if you want to do kind of an overview of it, I, it's always helpful, you know. Yeah, I think we need it. So, it, it, um, this was this was first hinted at in a famous paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in 1935. Einstein was trying to show there was something that didn't work about quantum mechanics. And the reason is, if you take two what are called quantum entangled variables, like two electrons, um, electrons that are entangled can now be separated as far apart as you want, zillions of miles. And quantum mechanics says that if you measure one where this the the particle has no part the particle will, will either be up or down fundamental quantum mechanics it is neither up nor down until it is measured when it's measured it's actualized as up or it's actualized as down so I use the phrase actualization instantaneously the other particle still entangled with it 14 million miles away is actualized down. If the first one was actualized up, the other one is actualized down. And Einstein said, this is spooky action at a distance. After all, he has a finite speed of light, right? Yeah. In special relativity. So there's this tension between the prediction, what things are supposed to happen faster than the speed of light. The history then is that a man named John Bell in the 60s thought of an experiment to tell whether Einstein was right or wrong. And three people just got the Nobel Prize last year in physics. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Klausner, Aspect, and uh, I'm forgetting the, the name of the, the, the physicist in Austria. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, it, they, they got the prize for work they had done quite a long time ago, right? And yeah, yeah. Well, the most recent was 2017. Basically, what... What Bell showed is if this, if if quantum mechanics is right, then there should be correlations between the measurements of ups and downs or almost ups and almost you know, the statistics should violate a limit in classical physics. That limit is two, whatever two means. Quantum mechanics gets you to something like two times the square root of two. And the experiments have been done and Einstein's wrong. It is absolutely true that that two particles that are entangled can be the the, the distance record now is a few hundred thousand uh, kilometers, and it's Einstein's wrong. They're instantaneously correlated, okay, yeah. or they're correlated. We assume that it's instantaneous, so that means something fundamental. It means that locality is false. It's fu fundamental. Well, we're going to have to deal with it. So. So this is a really huge thing. So let me take a minute over. Locality for Einstein is if, if I'm at a point and I'm sending a signal to uh, somebody at another point, 
think of me in three space. I have to be surrounded by a two-dimensional sphere, and it can't get from me to the other thing without going through the surface of that sphere. Or in four dimensions, it's, it's a three-dimensional sphere. That's called continuity of action, and it's a speed limit. This violates continuity of action. But that means that space-time isn't local. So, yeah. Well, so, and if I could jump in, you know, you are also, and this goes to the precognition side of things, not only is space non-local, but time right. isn't local. Right, it's not, and it's going to get to pre But I want to say, I'm just submitting a paper uh, that I worked on for seven years. Let me take a moment you hadn't expected to, to line this up. There is, we have chosen in cosmology and all of our thinking locality for obvious reasons. If non-locality is now established loophole free, there is no longer an a priori reason to choose locality as fundamental rather than non-locality as fundamental. Hmm. So let me say this. If we choose, if we choose non-locality as fundamental, then general relativity is not fundamental. It depends upon locality. String theory is not fundamental. Loop quantum gravity is not fundamental. The famous uh, anti-de-sitter space conformal field theory duality is not fundamental, nor is the holographic principle fundamental. Everything goes away. It's just astonishing if you start with non-locality as fundamental. And it, so I've now published one paper and another one up. There's ways to try to do it, and I'm, I'm trying. I think it's profound. I think we haven't even begun to understand what it means to give up locality in a fundamental way. Meanwhile, non-locality is true. Therefore, can it have anything to do with anything like the weird phenomena like precognition and, and telepathy and so on, which is where you're getting? And the answer is, of course, they can't. So go on. Well, it, so one of the things that I wanted to touch on was these all seem like information uh, phenomena. Right. And so when people think of psi or psychic, you know, they, they're also thinking of telekinesis and a lot of other there, there's a whole bundle of stuff that kind of gets rolled together. But really uh, what what yourself and Dean Radin seem to have been focused on was information based phenomena. Right. So exchanging communication at a distance, exchanging information at a distance. Care, you know. Careful, careful. No, OK, I'll tell you why. Uh, one does not have to. Information exchange suggests uh, the exchange of a classical physics signal, which cannot go faster than the speed of light. Okay. So let's not use information exchange. Something is happening, but it's not classical information exchange because it can't go faster than the speed of light. Okay. Go ahead. But something's happening, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and the the thought that I was kind of driving towards was what we're talking about is with these phenomena. We're we we're not talking about like poltergeist stuff for the no. most part. That's from what I've read. It does seem to be subtle. I've I've heard the term micro psychokinesis used, um, but these are all small scale effects, and so therefore they tend to be effects of mind, right? Like knowing things or or understanding things in a non-local way but you know again we're not talking about chairs and tables flying across a room so to speak not unless i get an argument coming at me for not taking the garbage out and it's <laughs> you know it's a guy thing i got i hope my wife didn't mind that joke so go ahead a couple sentences so let me see where you're going and then see what i well, want to Go ahead. Yeah, I, I that was just something to kind of touch on. I think another thing that I wanted to ask about was it seems like there are very distinct evolutionary advantages to something like precognition and, you know, even rudimentary non -lo, you know, non-local communication, right? And yeah. even if you don't have detailed precognition, having that spider sense, you know, like maybe there's something hiding behind that bush, that would definitely help people survive, you know. I mean, a, a yeah. hostile environment like our ancestors grew up in. So even if these, you know, even if these abilities aren't fully developed, right, uh, and maybe they can be, but even having just a tiny little bit of it seems like it would be an enormous survival advantage. Do you think this is something that the human race has evolved towards or is still evolving towards? Or do you think this might be a byproduct of mind? So, um, 
Dean makes the same point you're making. It's the hackles on the back of your hair going that when something. Yeah. So yeah. I actually do think it's almost certainly real. Uh, I'd like to back up a step and come forward. May I? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I have for years adopted Heisenberg's interpretation of quantum mechanics in 1958. I actually got to it independently, but you know he's got some credibility. So Heisenberg said, no, this is really fundamental. He said, look, the quantum state stands ghost-like between a dream and reality. So here's why he's saying it. We all know the Schrodinger's cat, which is simultaneously alive and dead because yeah. it's in a it's in a superposition state, uh, both here and there, both alive and dead. So the superposition state is both alive and dead, both here and there. That that's a contradiction in classical Boolean logic. The, the cat is alive and simultaneously dead. It's a contradiction, right? Well, it, it is, and yet, you know, it, something no, that was so strange a few years that, ago is being used for quantum computing today, right? Well, so, that, that's right, but I, I want to get to Heisenberg's interpretation. So just notice that the statement A and not A is a contradiction. Yeah. Alive and not alive is a contradiction. Um, so that's why we can't picture the quantum state. Now, stick in the word possible. So C.S. Uh, C. Pierce philosopher said, possibles do not obey Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. So try, the cat is possibly alive, and simultaneously, it's possibly dead. That's not a contradiction. Yeah. Because, because possibles don't obey Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. So, Ted, I, Tim, I just assumed that many years ago, that the quantum they'd have to do with possibilities. And that's the same thing that Heisenberg said in 1958, that the quantum state are potentia standing ghost-like between a dream and reality, where reality is true or false. So I'm going to use what was, in fact, my idea, too, but it's Heisenberg's. I'm going to call it raised potentia, ontologically real possibles, and raise extensa, ontologically real actuals. This is the first addition to the quartet from Spinoza and Berkeley and materialism and Descartes, because this is not a substance dualism. Possibles are not substances. So this is really important. Raised potential and raised extension does not inherit the mind-body problem. It just doesn't inherit it. And call out Heisenberg's, even though I, I did, in fact, find my way to it, and then because I read Peirce, uh, then it's Heisenberg's. Once you say that, it does not inherit the mind-body problem, period, and it, 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 it raises a perfectly good suggestion. What So actualization is converting a possible to an actual on this view. A couple things. Uh, that Possibles cannot entail what's actual. X is possible does not entail X is actual. That says there can be no deductive link between the quantum state and measurements, and the none's been found for measurement. No, no one's found a deductive theory, and it affords a perfectly obvious hypothesis for mind. Mind converts possible to actuals, mm, okay. and it doesn't. And this is really big. So, do you know this about Dean's experiment, the two slit experiment? Uh, I do not about that one. No. This may throw our conversation off a little bit, but it won't. It's worth it, okay? okay. It's really worth it. So probably everybody knows the famous two-sled experiment. Uh, you, you shine a flashlight at a, a, a panel with two slits in it, and you have a, a, a an emulsion on the far side. Um, and you could... But, Pause. What you do is you you cover one of the two slits. Only one slit's open. You shine the flashlight, and behind the open slit, you get a spot on the screen. Yeah. Change the slits open, and you get a spot on the, the screen behind the other slit. So what happens if you open the two slits? You don't get two spots. You get dark and light bands splaying between the, the two slits. It's called the interference pattern. Then you think, gosh, well, what happens if I turn the flashlight down, and if you shine the flashlight so one photon per hour goes, and you accumulate the results on the screen, 
you get the two sled experiments. So whatever is going on, it's going on with a single photon. That's the mystery, that's the mystery of quantum mechanics. We won't go into how quantum mechanics solves it with a wave equation. Anyway, they're interference patterns. Now I'm going to tell you Dean's experiment. Um, you sit next to Dean in Petaluma or 7,000 miles away, and he's doing the two-slit experiment, and he says, Tim, try to alter the intensities of the, sec of the adjacent uh, central light and dark pattern. And you kind of grunt and cry. I don't think, what, what does it mean to try? So there's a very weak positive effect. The experiment has been repeated 28 times. The overall statistics that it comes up by chance is it would come up by chance four in 100 billion times. This is stunning. Okay, you know what coming up by chance means, right? You, 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 you do an experiment and you want to know, well, could this happen by chance? So happening by chance, you know, if it's one in 20, it's marginally important. This is measured by the physicists in sigmas, the statistical standard deviations. Um, five sigma at CERN is considered a big event because it's so improbable. This is standing at 6.49 sigma. It's really powerful. Do I believe it? Not quite. Is it ready to be taken seriously? It really, really is. And to the physicists who may listen, I haven't done Dean's experiments with him and his colleagues. The right thing to do is to look at the experiments, and they're cheap. Let's have these experiments repeated independently a number of times. Talk to Dean. He knows how to do them. And let's find out if it really holds up. If it holds up with hundreds of independent repetitions, not merely 28, I'm going to say Dean was right. That means something profound, and it's going to get at everything we're going to talk about. It means something fundamental for quantum mechanics, and it means something fundamental for physics and our view of the world. If these experiments, and Dean's the hero of the story, mind can have a role in, quotes, the actualization of the wave function. That's huge. Let yeah. me tell you. Let me tell you, there's now accumulating evidence referred to by a guy named Ball that causal accounts of the collapse of the wave function, uh, like the spontaneous collapse theories or, uh, or uh, Roger Penrose's collapse, are essentially ruled out, where causal means physical cause. I take it the other So now think, if, if the quantum state are possibles, and what happens, a possible converts to an actual. A, a trailer impact isn't going to convert a possible to an actual. Converting a possible to an action isn't, isn't a physical mediated effect. It is not. But it's consistent with mind converting a possible to an actual. That's what we do when we intend to do something and we do it. So it's really lining up. So with all of that in mind, hold it. It's in our paper. Um, and some other papers, for the outsiders who think it's all nuts, it's not. Go look at it. There's a good chance we're right, and it's it's not trivial. It changes physics. It changes what the world is. Mind matters. And among other things, Tim, and then we'll get back to the rest of your questions, It it's the case that a, a responsible free will is no longer ruled out. So here's that problem. If it's determinism, you know, I was determined to pick up the rock and kill a little old lady. But if it's quantum, I shouldn't say that I'm 83. But but uh, but if I, it's quantum, I, I have I'm not determined, but it's completely random. Uh, just some random event happens, and I kill the little. So I have a free will, but I'm not responsible. But if I can play a role in the collapse of the wave function, I can be responsible. Mm, okay. Live with them. We've lived with compatibilism, the response to the Cartesian dualism, for a century. Or sort of the best thing out there is neutral monism. But in any case, Dean's results on his colleagues' results at now four and a hundred billion begin to hint for the world to hear, including the lawyers who argue with the philosophers. At this point, on that data, responsible free will isn't isn't ruled out. So let's get more data. Okay. Yeah. So well, if it's okay to jump in, um, yeah. 
I, I do want to ask about possible mechanisms. Yeah, please uh, so Dr. Stuart Hameroff, and you mentioned Hameroff, Penrose, and Orkor a few minutes ago. Uh, he proposed that microtubules could be doing some form of quantum computing. Uh, another uh, uh, idea that I've heard is frolic condensates. And again, both of those have been kind of poo-pooed by the scientific community. They've said that, you know, this warm, wet environment just can't support, uh, you know, these organized quantum states for long enough to make them useful. W what are your thoughts on that? Do you have any ideas what some of the mechanisms could potentially be in the brain? Well, let's come back to warm, wet environment. So that was absolutely the view until about a decade ago. A famous uh, physicist uh, calculated uh, correctly that decoherence, which is the law, it's the collapse of the, of the, it's not the collapse of the wave function, but it's the loss of course, happens on a femtosecond time scale. Okay. Then people, so there's some body of theory here that I'm involved in, and there's some experiments. Experiments have been done in a number of systems where coherence lasts a thousand times longer, which is it's, a, it's a 10 to the minus 12 seconds rather than 10 to the minus 16. That's this has been found almost certainly in photosynthesis. It's quite clear that bird navigation has to do with quantum phenomena. There's reasonable grounds to think that olfaction has something to do with quantum. There's a paper that was just published whose authors I don't remember. They used um, uh, an fMRI system, uh, a detuned fMRI, like a detuned Morris in England, uh, and they found evidence for something that must be quantum. They think it's in water in the brain. But in any case, there's now good evidence for quantum phenomena in the brain. Uh, all right. Um, so meanwhile, uh, my friends and I have a patent on something we call the poised realm. It, it turns out that uh, uh, the quantum coherent state can decohere. It loses phase information. And it becomes almost classical. It's not quite. But but it is now known that recoherence can happen again to the quantum state. So uh, Gabor Bate and I and, and Samuel Nernan some years ago filed a patent and have it on what we call the poised realm, which could both decohere and recohere. And it implies a phase transition that, that's quantum criticality. It turns out to be the metal insulator transition and it has very slow decoherence. And we have shown that a number of small molecules and proteins, in fact, are quantum critical. And that's all published and it's established. And it's very interesting. And Gabor is the one who's mostly responsible, Gabor Bate in, uh, in, uh, at Edvos University. So I think that the pl one plausible mechanism is quantum coherence in, for example, proteins, which have delocalized wave functions and, and they decoy very, very slowly. There's also grounds from friends of mine to say that the backbones of proteins are functionally classical, but the little side chains uh, may be decohering and recohering. So that might be a mechanism. There are things that are going on in water. Um, so let me come to, to this fascination with uh, microtubules. Uh, it's, Stuart's a friend, and he's wonderful, and he's an anesthesiologist, and maybe... But why, why microtubules? You know, there's thousands of different kinds of proteins. And one of the things that one could do is genetic experiments. Think of it as the genetics of consciousness, not the, not the neural correlates of, of consciousness, the molecular correlates. We can do genetic experiments and try to find out what molecules are involved. Maybe they're in your toenails. We don't know. Find the proteins involved and find their location. And Stuart's wonderful, but you know, why are we hung up for 30 years on microtubules. So I think there's evidence for quantum phenomena in the brain that at least has a length of 10 to the minus 12th time. There's this strange properties of, of very good electron conduction in proteins that is better than omic that Gabor and colleagues talk about. And there's direct evidence for, for quantum phenomena and probably non-locality. Uh, in the brain. I'm sorry, I can't remember the authors. I should have, but it's published. Uh, so they're there. Wonderful. On that note, let me thank you so much for your time today, Stuart. It has been absolutely wonderful talking with you. And let me close by asking, 
What comes next in this area of research? What do you see happening over the next couple of years, I guess, in general? And then where are you taking things yourself on a personal level? And you've been kind because you didn't get to your questions, but I hope that what I said was of use. Oh, uh, you know what? You went through so much. Yeah. I, I always write extra questions just in case. And in your case, you covered such an enormous, like just diversity as well as depth of information that I, I think uh, that's, yeah. Well, the first thing is the following. And I hope this podcast, your podcast will get out. Go read this paper. I, I think I'm the first author. Uh, I did the I did the philosophy part. He did all the experiments. It's time to stop saying it's got to be wrong about all of these phenomena. Um, many of them, many of us have had them. If mind is quantum, telepathy is possible, and psychokinesis is possible, and precognition is possible. My wife's had an astonishing precognition experience and dream when she was thirteen. It's just stunning. So these are all possible. Uh, so the first thing that has to happen in the near future is people stop poo-pooing it and repeating the experiments. We're on the verge of this becoming a legitimate area of research. Just think of the implications for physics if we find out that mind really has a capacity to actualize whatever the wave function is. That's stunning. It changes. It changes. We ha mind has been gone from physics since Newton ruled out raise cogitan so, so my, my guess is you know we've been lost since since descartes lost his raise cogitan <laughs> it's the quip so that that's the overwhelming thing let's just go do it um first second um with respect to quantum computing uh, everybody's hung up on quantum coherence and making quantum coherent computers i think there's something much more powerful to do let me take a moment to say it there really appears to be a poised realm where systems can go back and forth between being quantum coherent, decohere, almost a classicality, go back to being quantum, and actualization can occur, but it's known that after actualization occurs, the, the particle becomes quantum again. Hmm. So I think there's a poised realm. I know there is because I named my boat the poised realm, and so it's real. But more important, I think that we should be thinking about not quantum computers the way we're talking about it. It's what my colleagues and I want to call a trans-Turing system. Let's make systems, and the brain may be doing this, that are partially quantum, partially classical, go back and forth between them. You cannot integrate the equations because the Schrodinger equation doesn't propagate linearly in the presence of decoherence. So if you have a material that is partially decoherent, partially coherent, and go back and forth, complex peptide systems may do that. It will be a dynamical system. It won't be a flow on a potential. Nevertheless, it is. And it can get inputs that are quantum and classical and decoherent and outputs of the same kind. I think cells are that. And I think that has to do with how the mind-brain works. And we've barely gotten to it. So my bet is that in part we're, it's not that we're wasting time with quantum computers. So far, there's no grounds to think they could do anything that a classical computer can't do. They could just do it faster. So I will, I, I'm going to close by telling you, I've just published a paper with Andrea Rowley, The World is Not a Theorem, published in the Journal of the Royal Society Interface. We show we can use no mathematics based on set theory, none, to deduce the evolution of the biosphere, ever new adaptations. Bit computations as if it were a computer, a Turing machine. The evolving biosphere is not a Turing machine. And mind is not a Turing machine. The reason is, and this is fundamental, Tim, we can jury rig. Computers can't jury rig. So there's another paper that discusses this by Andrea Rowley and me, what is consciousness? And we, we claim rightly, a non-embodied Turing machine, universal Turing, cannot jury-rig. It cannot get outside of its own ontology. And a robot could jury-rig, but on such a slow pace that it would rust before it figured anything out. We're not, we're not Turing machines. If we tried to pass the Turing test and it involved Turing, uh, it involved jury-rigging, uh, a computer won't. I'm going to be very interested to see what chat GPT can do about 
jerry rigging it's got such a vast base that it can find correlations in anything but we we jury rig and you can't deduce jury rigging right when you jury rig something you think how could i use this thing to solve some problem you don't deduce jury rigging you have insight and insight is not a computation there's so much we don't know it's just opening up wonderful wonderful Stuart. Thank you again so much for your time today. It has truly been an honor, sir. Well, wow. <laughs> well, I'm glad to. I, listen, I would love to see the podcast as you're sending it out. Tim, this is all such big stuff. So much is at stake. So thank you. Thanks for the time.